Thank you very much. Um, and as you can probably tell, this isn't Ahmed Safi. Um, this is Wahida Kandika. She's um, one of uh, the Palestinian Animal League Solidarity's trustees in the UK. She's a senior lecturer in philosophy at Manchester Metropolitan University. And she stepped into the breach today because um, Ahmed, who some of you know, wasn't able to make it. Um, anyone, I don't know if anyone in here has seen our presentation, Activism Under Occupation, that we've been giving around um, Europe over the last 12 months. Um, the reason he's not here will become an anecdote for that presentation. Cut a long story short, border closures, visa problems, um, it's very difficult for our Palestinian colleagues to travel, and therefore we're representing um, the whole team. This has been co-authored by the three of us, so um, we're speaking on behalf of Ahmed and the Palestinian team as well. Okay. So... We wanted to tackle this issue, and again, anybody who came to our talk last year um, might remember we started with this kind of little word search and word association, um, where we were looking at sort of perceptions of uh, Palestine and, and people there. And we've kind of developed that because it's become quite a big issue for us and something that we really wanted to tackle and we really want to discuss within the wider movement. So we, we hope we've got time um, to have a proper discussion at the end because we'd be really interested to hear your thoughts. So. As we've already said, PAL is the only locally run uh, animal protection organization in the occupied Palestinian territories. Our work is often subject to derailing, um, misperception, deliberate misrepresentation. Some of the, um, which side are we on? Some of the statements you see there sadly are things that we hear quite regularly. The derailing of misperception and misrepresentation um, comes from both inside and outside of the animal rights movement. And it creates challenges, obviously, for our Palestinian team members, um, but also for people like myself, white Western allies who, um, whose work can influence that. So it creates challenges on both sides. So what we want to talk about in this presentation um, is how, the, how this occurs in the first place, where, where this sort of negativity comes from, and how we might be able to both both... Palestinians, also potentially other people of colour. We can't speak to that issue, but again, very interested to hear if this resonates with anyone in, in different areas, um, and how we can overcome it, and how white allies can ensure that they don't fuel this negative process. So the presentation seeks to consider how innocent first reactions um, might be manipulated, and how what seems like a very small thing might follow through to become something uh, really very serious and really very wide-reaching, which can have um, far-reaching impacts. So it's split into two parts. I'm going to deal with the first bit, um, testing perceptions. And then Wahid is going to take over with the case studies. Now, I'm sure you've heard before the sort of, you know, you only get one chance to make a first impression. Now, that's all well and good, but what if that first impression is already marred by... Uh, racial or cultural stereotypes, it becomes even more difficult. And the, the kind of little thoughts in the side, I'm sure we've all had them. You have those people you meet and you just click with, you just think, yeah, we're going to be the best of friends. You have other people that you just, you get a funny feeling about. You're not quite sure whether you're going to engage with each other or click. Um, and that's a really natural thing. So apparently, according to research, it takes between 0.5 and 7 seconds to make a first impression. Um, so we wanted to see how this relates to the, the kind of things that we'd noticed in our work. So we wanted to carry out a very simple, I stress non-scientific, um, survey to see if perceptions, reactions, and responses we'd seen during our work for PAL um, were applicable more widely. So we conducted an online survey. There were 75 respondents. It's not a huge sample. This is really just kind of beginning to explore the issue. But we felt that that was enough to sort of see if there were any clear trends. So some, anyone who's connected with me online may have actually taken part in this, so thank you if you did. We created a really basic survey. We asked people to tell us the first word or words that came to mind when they read the following. Palestine, the United Kingdom, we did because I was carrying out the research, so I can relate to that. Uh, Palestinian people and British people. So if, maybe you've all got words in your head for these things. The way we interpreted results, sorry, there's a lot of words here. Um, we consolidated the responses. Obviously, people, 75 people didn't say exactly the same word. So we consolidated them into groups with similar or identical words grouped together. We then made a value judgment on whether or not those terms could be considered to have positive, negative, or neutral connotations. Um, 
the term negative was difficult for us. It took quite a lot of discussion in the team to decide what, what we would um, describe as negative. So some of them were obvious. If it was critical of the country or the group of people, um, for example, if somebody said racist or corrupt, then that's quite clearly a negative impression. However, if it referenced something negative, so for example, there was lots of reference when we talked about Palestine and Palestinian people to freedom fighters and resistance and um, th those sort of related words. And we felt that because people's first go-to word or term was instantly linking Palestinian people with occupation, oppression, etc., whilst the people met saying that may have been sort of... Um, praising the Palestinian people for their resistance, we felt that if that's the very first thing you go to, that was negative. So we agreed between the team that that's how we'd run it. Um, a team was deemed neutral if it was um, either descriptive or ambiguous. Um, tea was said a lot in relation to uh, the United Kingdom, fish and chips. Um, and then also if there were words that we didn't know how the person... Um, giving them to us w was interpreting them. So radical, on the one hand, could mean fantastic and you know groundbreaking. It could also mean something negative. So we said, okay, we're going to term that as neutral. Okay. And then finally, positive was fairly easy. So if, if people were described as friendly or kind, or if a country was um, described as diverse, then that was positive. Okay. So what happened? I'm not going to go through all of these, don't worry. Um, so the word association with the UK, what we found ultimately that were loads of descriptive words um, and lots of contradictions. So where one person might say um, the people are cold, other people might say they're friendly, where um, some people might say they're diverse, other people might say it's racist. So what we found was whilst there were negative and positive, actually it sort of all balanced out and really there wasn't any clear opinion, if you like, about the United Kingdom coming out. So it's very much spread across the board, lots of mention of fish and chips and Big Ben, but nothing really that you could say, okay, this defines that country. Move on to Palestine, and I will read some of the words because it was overwhelming. The first word um, that was said most was oppressed, war, occupation, troubled, Israel, sad, fighting, and it goes on and on and on. There was only 3% of um, responses which had positive connotations in relation to Palestine. A third of them were neutral, so just generally descriptive or ambiguous, and 64% of them had negative connotations. So people's go-to words were very much negative. British people, we saw a very similar thing. Um, loads of kind of one answers because everyone was saying something different. And again, it was broadly kind of spread out. From this, you couldn't say that, you know, people have a very strong opinion about um, British people either way. There isn't sort of a really clear stereotype or, or term which describes them. Palestinian people, on the other hand, again, the first word, oppressed. That's the first word that comes to mind. Um, what I thought was quite nice, the second word was brave. The third word was friends. But the vast majority of it goes on to then crying, poor, conflict, um, abandoned. Um, so all sorts of um, negative responses. Not as much as when we talked about just the country. But again, 56% of responses when you say Palestinian people were negative or had negative connotations. Okay, so a picture speaks a thousand words. So we thought, following on from this, bearing in mind that that's what people are thinking, then people putting images which supposedly relate to this, you would have thought it would, quite, it would mirror sort of what we were finding with the words. <clears throat> so we Googled a series of words and set the results to display only. We took a screenshot. And we shared those pictures, um, and we asked people what they thought about them. So again, what's the first word or term that comes to mind when you see this? We use the search terms British people. It was an interesting um, collection of photographs. Um, and these are the responses. So the top five words, embarrassing and silly, which, I mean, look again. There's some, yeah. <laughs> um, comical, patriotic and nationalist, Britain, privileged. Now, again, there isn't any kind of, perhaps nationalist, I think that I think when people were saying that, they were talking about sort of nationalism in a, in a, in a negative way. But again, we didn't want to put that judgment on it. The embarrassing and silly seem to be quite tongue-in-cheek. But again, from here, I don't think you could get a clear idea of British people, if you like. When you actually look at the photographs, what did it actually depict? Um, relatively diverse, um, although mainly white. And importantly, if we look again, 
British people can be many things, many, many things. So they can be, in, that, in those pictures alone, actors, politicians, students, friends. They can be funny, they can be silly, they can be racist, they can be patriotic, they can be members of the royal family. So moving on now to Palestinian people, and I think you can see, it's good to see this on a, on a big screen, actually. Um, I think you can see that a very different set of photographs and the words used to describe resistance, war, turmoil, hope and solidarity, and Palestine. In the photographs, mainly Arab people depicted, of the 34 photographs, 14 of them were of demonstrations, four included soldiers, two were either of bombings happening at that time or bombed out buildings, and in 25 photos, no one's smiling. It's sort of very, it's sort of very journalistic, the, the um, photographs. And then finally, um, the search term animal rights activist. This is what came up. Again, there's, there's quite a few things we can see from those in terms of the description. The top five words that came out. Now, this is where I say it wasn't scientific because it sort of it came out of our organization. So I'm pretty sure a lot of people who answered this are obviously very sympathetic or they're animal rights activists. So lots of positive words. Activism, voice of the voiceless, protest, kindness and compassion, provocative. Now, when we, look, when we describe the picture... Then we have all but two people are white. One person of color is depicted as abusing animals. Oh, sorry, hang on, let's go back. Where are we? So there's a guy with the monkey in the middle. Um, where are we? So one white man is shown abusing animals. 38 are women, 14 are men, and 17 people are depicted undressed or partially dressed. Okay, so... What does that create? So it's just, it, these have been kind of really instantaneous reactions that, you know, 0.5 to 7 seconds first impression. What do you think of when we say this? What have we learned from this so far? British people are mainly white. There isn't no obvious politics, no obvious stereotype, no kind of blanket term you can apply to British people. On the other hand, Palestine and Palestinian people are defined by politics, occupation, conflict, violence, death, and suffering. An animal activist usually going to be white, usually female, um, and carries out activities, not exclusively, but carries out activities which may exclude members of other cultures, so um, naked protests, for example. And what this in turn tells us is that an Arab, Palestinian, Muslim man or woman is defined by politics, occupation and conflict. Um, they, and I've, I've used this in the sort of inverted commas, we hear that kind of very loaded they a lot in our work. They're not recognised as caring about animals, much less being animal rights activists. And in my experience, what then happens is people assume that PAL is an international organisation um, of white people who are educating Palestinians. The amount of times I've been asked if I'm out there educating the Palestinians, or even worse, rescuing animals from those Cruel treat the cruel treatment by Palestinians. So that's just sort of, I, I kind of want you to kind of hold that in mind. We're going to move on to the case studies now. So where does that go to? Where do those first reactions and those sort of, you know, sort of go-to points, how does that manifest itself and where does it end up? So the narrative, as we found, has clearly manifests itself in media portrayal of Arab, Muslim and Palestinians in connection with animals. And Wahida's going to take over and run you through them. Yeah, so hopefully we'll be perfectly timed as I'm uh, talking through each of the slides. So for the case studies um, and for the, for the rest of this presentation, or most of this presentation, I'm going to go through different examples from sort of media uh, clippings, but also some um, examples from uh, the, uh, directly from the experiences of the Palestinian Animal League. So we'll sort of um, finish with um, some of those. Um, and these are examples, we've picked these examples because the issues of race and negative stereotyping arise um, if, in them. So we'd like everyone to think about these um, cases, these issues, what sort of um, stereotypes are at play um, for discussion uh, at the end of the presentation. We'd really like um, as much participation in that as possible. So in terms of media manipulations, uh, the first example um, is from an organization called uh, Animal Equality. So in 2012, Animal Equality released an investigation into Harling Farm in Norfolk, which is in the UK. Um, there was uh, horrific animal abuse um, at the farm. And the farm was part of a, a scheme called Red Tractor, which is uh, supposed to guarantee high standards of animal welfare. Now, all of Animal Equality's messaging was very clear. 
This abuse is indicative of the industry. It's not just a one-off. So the investigation received a great deal of coverage in, uh, in the press, and this was a really good thing. Um, but the way in which some media outlets uh, presented the case was manipulated in favour of the farmer. Um, so if you think about this example. So the UK media took care to highlight the farm as a bad apple. The, the owner of the farm... Uh, the NFU and the Red Tractor Scheme were given uh, plenty of uh, opportunities, a platform to condemn the, uh, these actions. And so it further narrowed the blame to the individual employees involved, the bad apples. No suggestion uh, whatsoever was made that the British pig farm industry is inherently cruel. Consumers also are not blamed. Next example. So uh, Animal Aid ran an expose of a non-stun slaughterhouse. So uh, many of you will be, um, or remember this uh, uh, report. Now Animal Aid, clearly aware of the potential for the footage to be used to uh, further negative racial stereotypes, uh, the organization put out a detailed statement and a video highlighting that in eight out of the nine slaughterhouses investigated by them in recent years, cruelty had been uncovered. Now, only one of these slaughterhouses was a non-stun slaughterhouse. Now, like the animal equality campaign, animal aid were clear that concerns regarding animal welfare relate to every slaughterhouse, regardless of whether stunning is carried out. And animal aid were also explicit in what they published, that this was not about religious ritual slaughter, but about slaughter more generally. So as with the animal equality campaign, the media... Uh, managed to spin the story in a different direction, albeit in a completely different way than they had with the farm in Norfolk. Um, so looking at this headline, so the very first words uh, link cruelty with Islam. So the entire halal industry um, is criticised. So the article is critical only of halal slaughter, while the campaign which Animal Aid was promoting was focused on CCT, CCTV in animal slaughterhouses. So in you know, completely different conceptual issues at play there. So the statement from Animal Aid was edited by these outlets to, to remove reference to cruelty witnessed in the other non-stun slaughterhouses. And this is not even a news outlet, which is considered right-wing, which is where we would expect that kind of editing. Um, and in this, this example, kosher slaughter, for example, another form of ritual slaughter, is rarely mentioned. And it's certainly not in the headlines. And the article made no mention of the campaign being promoted by Animal Aid, which is for CCTV to go into all slaughterhouses. Rather, it focused on calls to ban religious slaughter in the UK. So think about the message that this sends. Let's consider stun slaughter on the one hand. So just a quick comparison there. So in the case of stun slaughter, individual perpetrators are blamed for animal cruelty. This is the bad apple argument again. Industry spokespeople are represented alongside the organization such as the RSPCA, and they're given a platform to share their shock, their disgust at the actions of a few individuals and they are depicted as uh, cooperating fully uh, to address the issue. So the difference in the coverage couldn't be clearer. In the UK, animal abuse carried out in secular farming is rare and carried out by rogues. In businesses associated with Islam, one case of animal abuse is indicative of abuse across the entire industry. So non-slaughter, on the other hand, the entire halal industry is represented by one case, despite recognition that those carrying out the, the abuse in this expose were not following regulations, Islamic regulations. So the discussion focuses on uh, potential to ban the practice outright. No such suggestion is made in reference to stun slaughter, the cruelty associated with that, which is focused rather on punishing bad apples. So focus on halal slaughter, this is, you know, the potential to ban this practice altogether, but focus on um, issues of cruelty and stun slaughter, no question that this is about um, uh, sort of uh, outlawing or banning the consumption of meat. Yet another example. So I want you to think about 
uh, what you see on the screen there. What does the headline and the photograph suggest to you? What do you think this article is about? When something says, um, waking the Middle East up to animal rights, um, with this uh, image in particular, um, you would expect it to be focused on um, the problem of animal abuse in the Middle East. In fact, the article is discussing work carried out by an, in, an animal protection um, and rescue group in Lebanon, which focuses on saving dogs. The photo they use to illustrate this story is of a young Palestinian boy dragging a goat to slaughter. So neither Lebanon nor dogs are um, suggested in this photograph. So when animal rights activists do great work in the Middle East, um, which is already a sort of a blurring phrase we use for that part of the world, um, the pervading stereotype continues to take precedence. So uh, just a quick note about this article. It was, a re uh, it was removed following a fact-checking fact um, process, and the journalist who wrote it also had various other stories removed uh, from circulation. Okay, so now to uh, a couple of examples um, from the Palestinian territories and uh, so uh, involved in the work of the Palestinian Animal League. Now, Compassion and World Farming released an expose of a slaughterhouse in Gaza. They contacted the Palestinian Animal League for a quote. Um, so Powell talked through the implications of this and were well aware of the risk of our quote being used tokenistically. So we, so we therefore wrote uh, the quote to make it clear that we did not approve of the incidents that had been recorded, but pointed to local work being carried out to address the issue, um, and local work by PAL. And this also helped to divert any suggestion of you know, those bar barbaric Palestinians. Um, rather, we made it clear that our team is working hard to make change. So I don't know um, at the back if you can read um, the, the quotation that uh, Compassion and World Farming actually issued. But on the next slide is the quote that we supplied. So as you can see, it's much longer. And it starts, we were saddened but not surprised to see the footage released today by Compassion and World Farming of the slaughterhouse in Gaza, in the Gaza Strip and in other places around the world where there is no meaningful regulation of animal agriculture, as well as a lack of public awareness about the reality behind the animal farming industry, this type of suffering is likely to occur on a regular basis. Now, this is a bit that was um, taken out. So it is exactly this kind of treatment of animals that the work of the Palestinian Animal League seeks to prevent. Uh, the challenges we face in the occupied territories in working to protect animals are certainly complex. So this is a more nuanced response. They're certainly complex, but, but not insurmountable. At present, our organization is working with the Institute of Law and the Ministry of Agriculture here in Palestine to support the development of a draft animal welfare law, which we see as an important first step to combating cruelty to animals in the long term. In the meantime, we continue to work hard to raise awareness on these important issues within civil society. So, so the lack of surprise expressed in the first part was a convenient and sort of uh, a reinforcing uh, quotation from Compassion and World Farming, but it wasn't what we issued. Um, so we don't know if this was done deliberately, but it was certainly not done with concern over the way in which the manipulation of our quote impacted on or reflected on PAL. Um, and I think you had an equivalent example from Animals yeah, Australia. Yeah, so just coincidentally, which is great in timing for this presentation, our team in the West Bank were meeting with a team from the International Branch of Animals Australia in the last few days. Now, they do an awful lot of work, um, as some of you will know, on live export. They're looking into export, um, I probably shouldn't give too much away because I'm, I'm sure they wouldn't thank me for it, but they're looking into export from a particular country into that area and they just wanted some insight. Now, instead of just going ahead and from their office, um, you know, announcing X, Y and Z, we did this and then getting a quote after the event, they've engaged with our team and our team have been in meetings with them for the last few days, helping them look into this in more detail. Um, we're yet to see the results of it and as I said, I shouldn't share their work publicly, but that is, for us, that was the way to do it. Um, and it's a kind of complete opposite approach the, to the one that we saw with Compassion in World Farming. 
<clears throat> okay, so um, the next example, um, and this again, this is, uh, there's been a lot of media coverage about this recently. Um, and these uh, photos from uh, what's been called, what's been dubbed the world's worst zoo. Now, before I go on and talk about that example, I just want you to reflect on that phrase. What does it mean to call something a world's worst zoo? Amongst sort of the animal rights community, is there such thing as a good zoo um, or a middling zoo? So what, what counts as the world's worst zoo? Who are they appealing to um, by coining that or, or using that phrase? Anyway, so the, this, uh, these photos are from this uh, zoo in Gaza, and these have now been circulated in the media several times. Um, and literally in the last couple of weeks or so, um, there's been a, uh, an increase in um, stories about this. Now, rarely do any of these articles explain that the reason animals were starving or had been killed was because of the devastating bombardments of Gaza during 2014. It seems somewhat cynical, even for the Daily Mail, which you're quoting up here, uh, to deem the zoo the world's worst. By the same token, a bombed out hospital could be considered the world's worst hospital. And how many times have we seen images of that on the news recently? Or a bombed out school, could we, could we call it the world's worst school? So while doing nothing to support either the an, uh, animals or people affected by the war, these stories, which fail to address the wider context, only serve, this is our contention, they only serve to fuel anti-Arab, Muslim or, or Palestinian sentiment. And they certainly perpetuate the idea that they, these others, are cruel to animals. Um, now again, and these are sort of further examples. And this also relates to um, the zoo. Uh, so when an international organization moved some lions from the zoo in, in Gaza to Jordan, the role of the Palestinian activists from our team who negotiated the move and played an instrumental part in the move were completely erased in all public statements. Not only this, but the Israeli press took the opportunity to advertise their involvement in the move by stating that Israel helps to move the animals. Of course, the fact um, that it was the Israeli state that bombed the zoo and continues to enforce the closed borders of Gaza, then saying that Israel helped is somewhat cynical, is, uh, you know, this is, this is the least we can say about it. So the only Palestinian voices in the article are those who work at the stricken zoo, thus perpetuating the idea that the civilized Westerners need to come in and rescue uh, the animals from the Palestinians. And I want you to reflect on, if you've seen some of these articles in the news recently, I think, I've, when I've read them, I've certainly seen, um, that's certainly the impression I've got. And I want, you know, I want um, some uh, feedback on that and whether that was your perception as well. Um, and just one more um, quick anecdote, so it's not a quick anecdote, about um, move, the moving of uh, some of these lions. So, uh, when it became apparent that a private citizen was keeping lion cubs in a refugee camp in Gaza, PAL, so the Palestinian Animal League, immediately began negotiations with the zoo, which sold them to the man, um, and uh, negotiations with the man who bought the cubs um, directly. Now, engaging with the police, it was arranged that in the absence of any animal welfare laws um, in the Palestinian territories, the police would confiscate the lions on human safety grounds. So on the day that the meeting bet between all parties was due to be carried out, it transpired that an international organization had contacted the man and offered substantial money for the cubs. The man immediately cut off negotiations uh, with the group and the rescue, so uh, cut off negotiations with PAL, which, uh, and the rescue was widely publicized. Again, with no mention uh, whatsoever of the lengthy negotiations with PAL that, were, um, that uh, had been involved. And the lions were removed uh, amid much fanfare. Now, subsequently, the owner of the zoo, who, who had agreed previously to allow PAL to work uh, to remove the remaining lions in the zoo, told Powell that he would continue to breed them and then sell them abroad. Uh, the man with the cubs had made more money from the rescue, the so-called rescue, than the zoo owner had in selling the cubs to him in the first place. It was a profitable line. 
So bear in mind, the, in, the, so going in and um, you know, not content, I suppose, with the, the, the slowness of the process, going in and uh, purchasing um, the lion cubs, all that's done is perpetuate the trade, essentially, um, in these animals. And also, obviously, foiling um, the, the great work. I mean, the idea that the police were going to step in and confiscate these animals would have set this precedent, which could have had really long-term impact, but um, we would have to start again if the situation arose again. Okay, so after all of that, <laughs> what message does this send? And I think now, I hope now it's becoming quite clear. What we hear all the time, and, it, and it's, it's, it's embarrassing and it's um, quite painful actually working with such incredible activists in Palestine. And then when I'm manning a stall or doing a talk and people take that assumption that we're this kind of international organization teaching those Palestinians, the things people say is, is, is pretty astounding. The amount of times I've heard the way they treat animals is appalling. Um, it's sort of good for you for going out there and, and doing something about what they're doing with animals. They need to be educated. Halal slaughter needs to be stopped. X is a cruel country or X people are a cruel race. And I, and I know the other, the other country that springs to mind where I hear this a lot is, is about China. So um, amazing grassroots movement in China, which is often ignored, and these kind of blanket statements we hear a lot as well. Again, the same could be applied. Terminology that we hear, subhuman, barbaric, uncivilized, savage. Um, they cannot succeed alone, but must be saved by international activists from civilized countries. Um, whenever we talk about, we have a spare and neuter program, whenever we talk about it, people say, oh, so have you got international vets to go out there? No, we've trained Palestinian vets. Palestinian vets have trained Palestinian vets to do this work. Um, and animals need to be rescued from these people rather than protected by these people. And I think what, it, what that sort of speaks to, obviously it perpetuates negative stereotypes. Um, it's not just damaging for the individuals who are regularly maligned and demonized, often despite best efforts, um, but it has a wider impact for the future. I think some of you um, may have heard this phrase, if she can't see it, she can't be it. It's a, it's a motto which I've, I hear a lot. It's sort of been adopted in relation to the empowerment of young women. And it's this simple idea. If a young woman has never seen a female CEO, it's very difficult for her then to aspire to do that because it's this idea, girls don't do that. And I think you can apply the same thing here. So, you know, the same could be said of young Arabs, Muslims, or Palestinians, if they're constantly told that they're cruel and barbaric, that they don't care about animals. Um, and the only animal activists they see are white, Western, um, or, the, or the main sort of um, promotion of animal rights activism is so sort of narrow that you, you Google animal rights activism and you get a page full of um, semi-dressed people. Whilst that, it's not criticizing the approach, it's saying that if you're looking at that as somebody that that just doesn't fit with you, then how do you access, how do you access the movement? Um, and I think I've seen this personally. It, it really saddened me. The first time I went to the West Bank, I was giving, um, so I was running some workshops with some of the students in Al Quds University, and a number of them asked me that you must think the way we treat animals is barbaric, don't you? So, well, you don't have a massive abandoned animal problem. You don't have factory farming at a, a absolutely incredibly, you know, a, a massive scale. They're different issues. It's a, the local context is very important, but these young people were already kind of feeling like, oh, the, the English woman's gonna tell us about our terrible treatment of animals. Um, and that isn't my experience of being over there. So of course, it's not to say that prote protesting the way you choose, um, as long as it doesn't harm others, is wrong. It's more about those of us who are white and are the kind of typical <laughs> represented. Oh, oh dear. <laughs> we okay down there in the front? Yeah, we're good. Um, those of us who are the typical representatives of the animal rights movement, working hard to ensure we recognize our position of power and our position of privilege, um, and to work to ensure that we are not negatively impacting others um, who might want to be part of the movement but can't necessarily see a way in. Um, we should be cognizant of the way in which our work might be manipulated. Um, and do all we can to guard against racism and xenophobia. If we see it, we should call it out. Um, and we've come up with some suggestions of how this might be achieved sort of in a practical sense. And I think we've managed to, yes, we managed to get through it in record time. We've got this, oh no. <gasps> we added something in about 10 minutes before we started. So we haven't, bear with me, bear with me. We're not done yet. Um, 
So these are some of the ideas we had. No, no. Yeah, and I, I, I like this slide just because it says, what can we do? So the promise of some suggestions for positive things, and we've, um, our list is essentially made up of other questions. Um, but, and, and this, is, this seems to be a, a sort of really popular or upcoming um, issue in animal activism, you know, consider the intersectional issues. Out of the problems that we, or the, the, the examples that we've talked about today, what are the intersectional implications of them? Um, ask the question, is it appropriate for our organization to tackle this issue? Do we have the requisite local knowledge? Have we investigated avenues for local cooperation, local resources, and so on? Would another project have more impact and longer-term benefits? And ask whether the proposed solution or action simply perpetuates the problem. You know, will I, you know, in order to save these animals, isn't it better that I just go in and buy them and get them out of, out of harm's way? What, what will the consequences be of that action? And then also recognize and prepare for the potential misuse of your campaigns. Um, call it out if it happens, um, which Liz mentioned just a moment ago, and take greater care when your campaign presents people, culture, or countries who are not there to represent themselves. Which, of course, um, ironically, without our, our Palestinian colleague here, we're kind of in that position to a certain extent today. But also within our organization, um, it is often the case that um, me or Wahida or somebody else will have to represent our colleagues internationally because they literally sometimes they're just not allowed to leave um, so it's something just to always have in the forefront of your mind if you're talking about someone who can't be there I guess that applies anywhere it's not just about cultures and um, countries it's about if you're representing someone who can't be there are you representing what they would want you to be saying about them and about their work so in, in order to, we're go, we are going to end on a positive note. We've been all we mostly are. doom and gloom. So there's this quotation that Liz really likes um, from Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. Um, so she says, stories matter. Many stories matter. Stories have been used to dispossess and to malign, but stories can also be used to empower and to humanize. Stories can break the dignity of a people, but stories can also repair that broken dignity. And we've had uh, mention so at the start of today, uh, of today uh, mention of feminist theory. And we can look to um, feminist theorists and other critical discourses for the insight that it's not a single overriding truth of this or that group's value and that, that actually helps us to progress. There are, rather, it's the openness to many voices, many stories that matters. So in animal advocacy, which is supposed to be the movement that gives a voice to those who have none, so in the human sphere, they don't have a voice in the human sphere at the very least. Surely there is something wrong in suppressing the voices and the stories of people whose help we most need in the struggle to improve the lives of animals. And so we wanted to share another story, a different story about Palestine and about a small group of Palestinians. Um, I really hope the sound works on this. The whole idea of the yeah. cafeteria began with like the whole group. الكافيتيريا اللي رح نعملها بالجامعة رح يكون فيها أكل نباتي وما يكون فيها لحوم وإنه رح تكون خلي من المنتجات الإسرائيلية. We uh, talked together, we talked it over, and um, we found it's a really good idea, so we suggested it to the university. الكافيتيريا نفسها بتوقع إنها رح تقدم أكل إن شاء الله كثير زاكي. والفائدة في اللحمة بتقدر تلاقيها في أي شيء من مواد بالنبات. It's going to help a lot of students. It's going to help a lot of animals. It's going to do good to the nature. We need people's support in this, not just money. We need their, we need their help in everything. والجميع يعرف شو هو الشعب الفلسطيني وشو ممكن الشعب الفلسطيني يقدم هدفنا نوصل صوتنا لكل العالم يعني I 
I, my goal in life, like most people's goal in life, is to make a difference. Okay, so just ruin the, just ruin the. Um it's ruined the ending there. So what this um, what this is about is part of the Youth for Change program. It's a program that's run by PAL um, in uh, five universities now in the West Bank. It um, Arori, the the young man who's speaking there, he's the kind of student mentor. We worked with the students to develop leadership skills and um, all sorts of different concepts like democracy, participation, communication. Those students then went into schools and worked with groups of school children to help them develop child-led projects. And incredibly, these guys, um, the young group of 14-year-old girls, decided they wanted to establish a vegan cafeteria in a university they don't go to yet because they wanted to have vegan options when they graduate and get there because they aspired to go there. And incredibly... They, we've obviously supported them, but in the last month, we've run this sort of fundraising campaign to make it happen. We've raised over £11,000 for the startup costs. This group went into the university. I would have been terrified to do this when I was 14. Went into the university, asked for a meeting with the president, said, we'd like to do this. What do you think and how can you help us? And the president said, okay, yeah, then, no, that sounds like a good idea. I tell you what, I'll give you the space in the university campus for free. Um, and will allow you to donate all of the profits, 50% to Pals Work for Animals, 50% to um, scholarships for struggling students. Um, I'm going back out to the West Bank in about three weeks, and I hope to be there when Sudfa opens. Um, but the fact that this came from a group of young women who are still in school in Palestine, this is the kind of story that... Yeah, the, the, the war and the occupation, of course, that's an incredibly important story to tell. Of course it is. But let's not forget there are other stories. And just like in every other country in the world, there are incredible people, incredible young people who are willing to make a difference and working to make a difference. And we should make sure that we're telling their stories as well. Okay, that's it from us. Thank you very much for listening.